Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Mega Life 21 Mayhem. And I am proud to announce you will view, as of now, a brand new segment of Mega Life 21 Mayhem called Honest Craft Beer Reviews. And my guest, in just a little while, will be the founder of this brand new Facebook group, Honest Craft Beer Reviews. Mr. John Starodumski, and this is the first show, officially, technically the very first show of Honest Craft Beer Reviews, and uh, welcome to the, uh, the debut of Honest Craft Beer Reviews. As you can see, I have my uh, cozy, rustic fireside chat going as my introduction, so... Now I'm going to introduce and bring on the founder of Honest Craft Beer Reviews, Mr. John Starodomsky. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to a Mega Life 21 Mayhem. This is a very special segment of Mega Life 21 Mayhem. I'm your host, James P. Madonna of uh, Mega Life 21, the hardest hitting progressive internet talk radio station on the planet. And I am proud to announce that this is the first show, the first interview with a very special group that started on Facebook, and I am here with the founder of that group, uh, Mr. John Starodumsky. Mr. John Starodumsky founded uh, Honest Craft Beer Reviews, and for those of you that are not familiar with it, just study the title and you'll know what that, what that means. Most of you people out there, the average person in America, especially you college kids, uh, you're only familiar with beer in terms of how much you can guzzle until you get a buzz. You don't, you don't, you don't know about real beer. You're not accustomed to the complexity of real old world style craft brewed beer. You only drink it to get, to get a buzz. And most people are only familiar with that commercial that I don't know how they get around doing it to, to get away with it. Anheuser-Busch saying that Budweiser is the king of beers. Well, let me tell you something. The Budweiser commercial is only as valid as the fecal matter that comes out of the Clydesdale's ass. <clears throat> because I don't know how they... I know supposedly beer started in Europe in, uh, what is it, Budweiser, Czechoslovakia, John? That's... Uh... Uh, where the Budweiser that we know uh, today, the American Budweiser, is inspired from beers. Uh, Budweiser in, in a town called Budweiser in uh, the Czech Republic. That's right. And there's actually a beer there called Budweiser, Budvar. Um, and uh, the two, they duped it out over the years over who really has rights to the name. Of course, here in America, you know, our, our uh, Anheuser-Busch usually wins that battle. Uh, so Budweiser Budvar, if you've ever seen Czechvar in the, in the, in the stores, that's actually the original Budweiser and it's a lot better beer too. Oh, okay. So. Oh yeah. I was just going to say, it's probably no comparison. Well, I'm yeah. drinking right now. Well, I'm going to take my first sip. This is a Polish beer, a porter. You might be familiar with it and I know I'm not going to pronounce it right. Z, 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 Zawik, Z, hold on. Let me see if the camera... Z-Y-W-I-E-C? Is that... Yeah, Z yeah, that's it. Hold on. Yeah, that's a great beer, actually. It's a yeah. fantastic beer. Zawik Porter. And I'm going to take the first sip now. Because, yes, we can drink. Yes, we can swear. And we can say anything we want because we are corporate and FCC-free. That's right. And Honest Craft Beer Reviews, in my opinion will eventually become the greatest, uh, uh, most sophisticated beer publication in the universe, in the galaxy, because you got some heavy hitters over there, John. I, I'm proud to be a member, and I'm constantly referring the group to other people I know. Thank you for that. Especially yeah. the pro, some of the pro wrestlers I know. You got, we got Superfly Jimmy Snooker as a member. I know uh, Red Rooster really appreciates that. He's uh, he's always been interested in the in the wrestling. So you know, I should you I, get beer and wrestling together in the same place. You know, you know, you're in for a good time. The Iron Sheik loves beer, and um, 
Uh, Red Rooster and I are big pro wrestling fans, old school wrestling fans. I used to work for pro wrestling for over 10 years uh, as a bad guy manager, and I did color commentary. Uh, oh. And um, let's see. Okay. All right. Skype just reminded me that I have very high volume coming from the speakers, but you know what? I'd rather have high volume than not enough. Um, now, the history of beer, from what I understand, John, um, it, it started in Mesopotamia in the Babylon area, Babylon. Yeah, that's right. It goes back about 6,000 years. Nobody's sure how uh, really the first beer was made, but there's uh, it, it wasn't made with hops. We know that much. That didn't come until um, somewhere in the vicinity of 1,000 years ago. But... Um, the, the, the suspicion is that somebody left a, uh, a, a loaf of barley bread overnight uh, or out for a couple of days by accident in, a, in an urn it filled with uh, rainwater and uh, it just spontaneously fermented from the, the wild yeast in the air. You know, so, that, was, that was my next question. I, I was yeah. going to ask you whether, whether beer was uh, discovered by accident or was it a modification of a, de of a developing recipe, but you answered my question. The question, it was developed by, it was discovered by accident. From what I understand, chiropractic was too. But some things are, even tea, this, the legend of tea in China, you know, leaves accidentally fell into boiling water and then they liked the way it tasted. And Yeah, I mean, it's amazing how a lot of the uh, staples we have today were discovered by accident. There you go. I mean, I, I don't think we'll ever know for sure. And that's not just true of beer. Mm -hmm. That's true of a lot of different things. But, you know, I'd like to, to uh, shake the hand of the guy that was uh, bold enough to find that uh, fermented pot of, uh, of barley bread and, and take a sip and decided, you know, hey, I like this stuff. Let's let's try and make it again. So Yes, yes. I, 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 let me salute this, this ancient Babylonian with the shillelagh for accidentally discovering beer and all fer fermentation fermented beverages to say the least wine red wine is medicinal um you know made a little hard liquor and with moderation i hear is 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 good for you in moderation that is but absolutely any, yeah, absolutely um okay so uh ancient babylon and uh when uh, of course i i i covered the the part about the average person not really being aware that beer, like fine wine, there's a lot more to it than, than just getting a buzz from carbonated uh, beverage. It is, uh, I, 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 I listened to a radio program back in the 1980s that described a microbrew beer, and this was after, I think Sam Adams first started advertising. I'm not sure when they first started, but they were talking about microbrew beer and people that went to Europe and their job was to, to taste and sample beers of the world. And they said that the nutritional value of, of a dark microbrew beer was equivalent to eating a, 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 a real European whole wheat bread. It had B vitamins in it. it had, there is nutritional value along with the buzz and the flavor. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the biggest benefit is is uh, vitamin B. Um, you're really only going to get that uh, in, in appreciable quantities in bottle conditioned beers, uh, and then you got to swirl the yeast at the bottom and drink it. But right. you know, if you've ever been to the pharmacy and seen bottles of brewer's yeast as a B vitamin supplement, that's, right. you know, that's why because it's just packed with it. So, yeah, brewer's yeast is uh, was uh, the very first so called health food along with desiccated liver that was ever developed that you know it was it was the uh the first introduction to b complex was from brewer yeast and yes brewer yeast i assume is after the beer process is finished and the tank is is dry whatever's left of the, the deceased the dead yeast that was once active i believe stop me if i'm wrong that becomes brewer yeast it, uh, it can. Uh, and brewer's yeast is sold as a supplement. That's that's exactly where it comes from. Um, but the brewer's yeast that you see, that's not what you see in a bottle conditioned beer. German Hefeweizens, for example, you know, uh, those are those are uh, always bottle conditioned, and uh, that's 
that yeast that you see in the in the bottom of the, the bottle is actually a supplemental uh, addition right before bottling. So it oh, actually wow. gives you a uh, uh, it gives you a little bit more combination than you would get otherwise. In addition to the nutritional value. Well, so. I'm ha I'm having my supplement of B complex right now. So there you go. It's a great way to start a Sunday. Yeah. Oh, by the way, besides Yinling, uh, this the Polish beers are um, amongst the uh, the most reasonably priced of the micro brews. I noticed. At, at, yeah. At, you know. The Russian beers. Uh, there are some good ones. You know, some of the imported beers that are, are uh, low priced and reasonably priced are not all that great, and you know, then you're not getting a bargain, so it's not a good deal. But the Zavik Porter, the Okachin Porter. Uh, those Polish beers uh, usually are a really good value for you, man. and the youngling is too. So, well, this is a weak uh, porter tastes a lot like Guinness Stout, and I love Guinness Stout. Those dark malty flavors going on. Okay, so. now when were you, as far as um, your uh, the time in your life? What? How old were you when you were first introduced to craft micro be micro brewed beer? When you first discovered that beer was a hell of a lot more than just getting buzzed. Well, I turned uh, 18 in 1982. Uh, okay. So there goes the, the uh, age secrets out of the bag. But uh, back in those days, 82, 83, I, I, the first beers that I cut my teeth on, uh, believe it or not, I drank Bush and uh, quickly got tired of that. And I moved on to Beck's and St. Pauli Girl, uh, started to look at the German beers. And... Um, uh, I, I actually had a friend who, uh, he, he drank uh, pretty much the same stuff, but he had this great idea to start a beer bottle collection. And I thought, you know, that's pretty cool. He had all these beer bottles on, on the wall of his bedroom. And uh, I said, I'm going to do that. And I did. And what happened along the way was, um, as I bought the beer and tried the beers that were in the bottle to add to my empty bottle collection, and, you know, I found out, hey, uh, this stuff is actually pretty good. And you know, in 82, 83, it started to, we had, uh, of course, from uh, from the beginning of those days, um, you, your uh, your selection wasn't all that great. You had your Sierra Nevadas, of course. You had your Anchor. Uh, but other than that, Sam Adams didn't come along uh, for another few years. But when they did, they, you know, they came right out of the gates with all kinds of styles. They had, had their winter lager. They had yeah. their Bach. They had double Bach. Uh, you know, just fantastic beers. Uh, for somebody that was, uh, you know, really hungry to try those styles, so that's okay. how it all got started for me. And uh, yeah, I was of course uh, introduced to uh, high quality beer. It was it? Well, I was going to say Sam Adams, but actually, my first introduction to real beer was the popular European beers like Heineken and and Beck's and um, Saint Pauli Girl. Um, but I didn't really appreciate the finer, finer, darker beers until I tried Newcastle Brown Ale. There you go. And Boddington's. Um, and, uh, let's see. Uh, of course, Guinness. Yeah, yeah. Well, Guinness came later because everybody was freaking out. Oh, you can't drink Guinness straight. You have to mix it. I go, well, mix it. What? I don't want to mix it. I says, you know, I like my I like my coffee, you know, rich espresso, you know, I like I'm not allowed, I can't have caffeine anymore, but I used to. Anyway, I, that's the way I like the beer. I'm not mixing anything. So I tried it. Everybody was impressed that I was able to guzzle the Guinness stout straight. And um, I says, "Hey, this is good. I like full flavored things. Just like I like hot and spicy food. I like everything hardcore, you know." And, uh, and that's how I was introduced to it. Now, I want to discuss, now this is my first time doing a show with a, a person like yourself, a connoisseur on fine beer. So how am I doing so far? I'm trying to, I'm trying to structure the, the interview. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Thank you. Whenever you're talking about beer, things are usually going to go uh, pretty well, but you're asking the right questions and, uh, and this is good. I like it. Thank you, thank you. I know you're accustomed to me doing shows about politics and religion and current news topics. This is very different from that, so, you know, I'm, I'm a neophyte when it comes to this, but uh, I'm trying to, uh, actually, Mr. Red Rooster, who I should actually call my co-producer, 
he told me um, that I should write down some things and try to structure it to get it off to a good start. Because once you, once you get, you break the ice with basics, it just flows. The interviews and shows, it's just like, I like to ad lib everything like, like Jackie Gleason did with the honeymooners. I do too. I think, you know, what, especially, especially, and it's interesting you mentioned religion and politics and beer. Yeah. They're all great topics. Uh, it's probably not always good to mix them. Uh, you know, sometimes people get too excited uh, when they're talking politics uh, and they don't agree with somebody. I got a light bulb. A few too many brews in them. But, you know, that said, these are things that once you get started down the path, uh, and there's, you know, there's no right, wrong way to go, I think. The questions sort of just flow out of each other. So. I'm, I just got a light bulb. I'm glad we brought up the subject of politics and beer because let me tell you something. I got a vent and I got to use the shillelagh. Prohibition. The right wing fundamentalist zealot religious nuts way back when decided for everyone that alcoholic beverages were to be uh, become illegal because these people like Mr. Uh, Rick belongs in a sanitarium Santorum believe that they should force their interpretation of the Bible on other people so because of the right-wing movement they made alcoholic beverages illegal all of a sudden after thousands of years and beer was included in that I assume and, of course, you had the speakeasies and you had uh, uh, dangerous uh, homemade moonshine brews that were, you know, like, like they had, for, there was formaldehyde in some of the whiskey. <clears throat> Excuse me. We, we, can do, we can do that on internet radio. There you go. Howard Stern does it on satellite radio. And what are you going to do? Anyway. <laughs> Especially yeah. on, a, on, a, on a beer show. That's, it's a beer show. What the hell do you want, man? There you go. What the hell do you want? Or better yet, what the fuck do you want? So yeah, we can say that, that too. We can say that too. All right, now, getting back to prohibition. Yes, and then it became dangerous because of the, uh, the questionable liquors that were served back then. But that's an example of incorporating politics with uh, spirits, you know, alcohol, alcoholic beverages. Uh, not that I call beer, beer is not hardcore. Beer is like, beer to um, to liquor is like marijuana is to uh, the dangerous drugs. It's, fr right. it's, it's frivolous. To and that's because it's the, so it's the, uh, it's got, for the most part, the lowest strength of, of, you know, of any of wine as a rule is stronger than beer and then spirits stronger than that. But prohibition was, you know, I mean, it's, as you say, it, it was a, uh, an attempt by some to impose uh, their moral beliefs on the rest of us. And as we know, it was a, it was a dismal failure. Um, you're just not going to take something that uh, people, um, people enjoy and uh, are accustomed to. And especially, you know, at that time with the, uh, the, the cultural makeup of the U.S., you know, you had a lot of Irish immigrants in the East, you had a lot of German immigrants. Uh, in the Midwest, um, there's just no way you're really going to take take their beer away from them, and uh, and then it didn't work. It just you know, uh, it people people found a way around it. In many cases, the government just made made uh, with prohibition. They made the problem worse because, as you say, a lot of the the prob, uh, the alcohol that was available was a very poor quality, and you know, I mean, people went blind, people died from it, people were paralyzed. Uh, they were mixing all kinds of stuff with it, so uh, it's it's a it, it's a monumental example of a of a social experiment that failed. Yes, abs absolutely. Uh, and I also salute the the German immigrants for introducing the United States to beer. And I assume they went to Wisconsin and uh, that area, Wisconsin. Uh, I know there's a large Polish population in Chicago, uh, Germans in, in Wisconsin. And uh, I guess the uh, Scandinavians went to Minnesota and became lumberjacks. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just taking a well, right. You, I, I you can find them scattered across the country, but the concentration really was in the Midwest. There was already a, a tradition of, you know, when the English colonized America, they brought the ale tradition with them. But what the Germans brought uh, was lager. Uh, lager at that at the you know you're talking 1860s 1870s right. when uh, we started to see large numbers of uh, German immigrants maybe even a little bit before that 
and they were drinking lager beer, and it quickly caught on. So that 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 was the origin of lager in America. Okay, yeah, that was my next question. Um, the differences in the beers. That was another basic segment. Uh, the differences is the differences between like lager, pilsner, stout, black and tan, ale, India pale ale. Uh, lager being the most popular heavy duty full body beer, right? Of the most popular of the That's full right. body beers. Now now Pilsner I hear has to be fermented in the cold, cold temperatures. Is that true? Yeah, no, it's actually true of any lager. Pilsner is a lager style and um, they uh, they're they're cold fermented and uh, they're cold aged too. And uh, uh, that that cold aging and cold fermentation, um, they kind of smooth them out. It accents the soft malt of the beer, and you're not going to get uh, the uh, the fruity esters like that you will, for example, in an ale. Ales are, uh, by contrast, they're they're uh, warm fermented and they they're not they're not cold aged, uh, and they're not aged as long as a lager is either. Actually, lager in German means to store, so really? that's where the name came from. Yeah. So. Now, so. now with stouts, they do they roast uh, the barley uh, malt. Uh, I mean, there's barley, there's hops, but is when they say malted barley, does that mean the barley has been sprouted? That's right, Mal malted barley. Uh, uh, basically, it's just a, it's partially germinated, and what that does is it lets some of the starches start to evolve and convert to sugars that you can ferment with. There's actually further. Uh, Conversion of starch to sugar in the in the mash process uh, when you go to make a beer, but uh, those are essential. You know, you have you have uh, dextrins, which are uh, uh, non-fermentable sugars. They they add flavor to a beer. Uh, but then you have your fermentable sugars, and that's what the yeast chow down on, and they turn it into alcohol and carbon dioxide. So okay, yeah, the the the, the primary food of yeast in all fermented beverages is sugars, and they sugar the sugar. Same thing when I make uh, key, uh, homemade kefir, uh, you know, uh, yeah, yogurt, uh, the lactose, anything that ends in O-S-E, anything that's an O-S is a sugar. It converts the lactose to another, the lactose to another form. And the same thing happens with wine. The same thing happens with, with beer. Now with the stouts, they, the, what makes it dark is, is it because they roast this barley malt before they make the stout, the stout initially or? Yeah, all dark beers are, are uh, uh, they use roasted malt, and some, uh, especially stouts, use roasted, unmalted barley uh, in various proportions. Um, and really, that you know that imparts a flavor. And um, if you think about it, uh, a lot of times when I'm if I'm reviewing a porter or a stout, you know you'll get those chocolatey notes in it, or maybe you'll get those coffee-like uh, espresso notes in a particular beer. Uh, and the reason you do is because cocoa beans and coffee beans are roasted. Uh, as well, and uh, that same process imparts the flavors to can impart the uh, flavors to barley malt than it can to, to coffee and chocolate. So that is true. That is very true. Um, I can't get into the wheat and oatmeal based uh, beers and ales and stouts for some reason. I, I want to. I, I can only. I only like the flavor of the barley based ones. But uh, I haven't been to too many microbreweries. I've been to Stout's Brewery, and I think it's Adams Town, Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's a great brewery. I was out there probably about 12. It's been a while. Probably about 12 years ago, I was out there. I actually took my kids to Hershey Park, and uh, that, that we stopped uh, for, for, uh, for a meal at, and a few beers at Stout's. There's a German, and, uh, German restaurant uh, connected to it? Yeah, that's right. Very I think that's uh, Carol Stout's husband that runs the restaurant. Oh, really? Yeah, I uh, um, um, I ordered uh, what did I order there? Sour broughton and potato dumpling and spetzel and uh, bread cabbage. Yeah, I think that's what I had there. But it's uh, it was a very old world Bavarian looking building. It was that very cozy, very very rustic. Uh, and of course, I've been to Salem Brewery up in Salem, Massachusetts, because I used to go there. Uh, if if Halloweeny fell on a weekend, the place was like Mardi Gras was packed, and I would go up there every year. Uh, and I would stop at the Salem Brewery and have their beer, beer dough, uh, old-fashioned, whatever, brick oven, I mean, uh, coal-burning oven pizza that they would make there. I, I guess they would add their, their micro-brew to a beer to the dough, which gave a nice flavor. 
and then their stout was called the black bat stout yes, and, and then cool. i would i would try the blueberry ale and the pumpkin head ale interesting both very good and they have a, a watermelon ale that they do in the summertime that's ex extremely refreshing too <laughs> watermelon ale yeah i guess you know uh, the, the 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 concept of flavoring beers and ales really took off i mean you could I mean, they're flavoring vodka. What the hell, you know? Why not? Well, actually, so the tradition of, of flavoring beer goes back a long time. As I said, hops probably around the year 1000 AD, some, somewhere in that vicinity, if I, if I recall correctly, is when the, uh, hops started to show up in beer. But before that, you know, beer was, it was uh, seasoned with all kinds of things, herbs and spices and fruit. Uh, so the tradition goes you know, goes back a long time to, to use those, and and why not? I mean, you know, those those are uh, fair game for for the yeast to to ferment, just like uh, 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 malt is, or anything, or grapes and wine, or or uh, you know what have you. So, and you get some really good results. Yeah. So. Well, well, the Germans used to make uh, something called May wine uh, at a certain time of year, where they put strawberry juice and uh, a herb called Woodruff. In yes. this, in the, it was a white wine with with these flavors, and they, they it, it happened in the springtime, and uh, as it was, it's a tradition. So flavoring wine, uh, oh gee, I, I, some people used to laugh at me for drinking it, but it was a place called uh, during Prohibition. They were the only it was the only company allowed to supply wine to the churches, uh, Brotherhood um, Winery, Brotherhood Winery in Washingtonville, New York. And I, I, I think it's Rockland County. I could be wrong. Or Orange County. Orange County. Orange County. I think. Anyway, they they have something called Holiday, and it was a, it was a spice wine, with many herbs and spices in the wine. It was it was like a like a sherry or or a port, that was flavored. So, excuse me. The concept of flavoring beers and wines, really, uh, it was always. It's always been around, but it really took off, you know, because now, we, like I said, we have the flavored vodkas, like the kettle, the kettle company, and so on and so on. So the Germans make a glue wine as well, which is literally glow wine. Uh, that's popular in the um, in the in the winter months and uh, glow wine. Uh, they still, and the, yeah, glow wine. I would think and Monsanto it, would make some toxic thing called glow wine. <laughs> Be that, but yeah. that's another talk show, Monsanto. But anyway. There you go. Yeah, but, they, uh, so, but the one thing about the Germans, so they'll add, add spices to their wine, but uh, as far as their beer is concerned, um, they're pretty, pretty um, conservative about that. They did pass the Reinheitsgebot in 1516, right. and it's actually a beer purity law and uh, pretty much limits, you know, in Germany you can make beer with uh, barley malt, hops, water, yeast, uh, and, and of course they make wheat beers, and, mm -hmm. and, and that's it, grains. Uh, are, are restricted. They do make some rye beers, but other than that, you know, you won't see the spice ales that you see all over England and uh, well, actually not even so much there as in the United States we do it. Um, but the English put uh, lots of things in there that the, uh, um, the Germans would, would uh, consider to be sacrilege. The Belgians, they, they, uh, they're, they're always adding fruit and spices and things to their beers, but Germans will allow you to put something in your beer after they sell it to you, they consider it your affair at that point. But uh, and, and they're actually they, they have a uh, there's a um, specialty beer that you can get in Berlin, uh, and a few examples are sold here in the U.S. called uh, 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 Berliner Weiss, uh, appropriately enough. And wow. and they're fond of adding Woodruff, as you mentioned before, <laughs> and uh, and raspberry and other other things to that after the fact. But okay. but they won't sell it with those things in the bottle. So. Well, well, an Englishman told me one time that uh, they they mix the uh, good uh, uh, English ale with uh, the woodpecker hard apple cider, and they called it a uh, a snake bite or a shark bite, yeah. snake bite. It's a snake bite. Yeah. Snake bite. Uh, I know. I like woodpecker. I like the Irish hard cider better. Uh, um, oh man, what the hell is it called again? Uh, uh, Mag Magners Magners hard yeah. apple. Thanks. Yeah, Magnus is good. But anyway, of course, then there's, there's an Irish ale called uh, Smithwick. Yes. Made by right. a company. Made by, I think it's the same. It might be the same company. It's either the same company that makes Guinness Stout or the the, the, the Magnus. I think it, they make the same company that makes Magnus Hard Cider, Smithwick. Uh, now, 
You, of course, have traveled and been to many microbreweries, as opposed to myself. And uh, have you, do you also go uh, to any in Europe or just mostly the United States? No, it's mostly, uh, I've been to Canada and uh, the U.S. Uh, haven't really traveled to, to Europe yet, although it's on the agenda to get there one of these days. Do they, uh, they speak in Canada? Do they still make Grizzly? I haven't seen Grizzly in years. That and um, Moosehead and uh, uh, all those great Canadian uh, beers. Black Label, not the stuff you get down here, but the real Canadian Black Label. I remember uh, uh, drinking some of that with a... a uh, one of the famous uh, Vian Fume sandwiches, which is like a smoked meat sandwich up in wow. uh, up in Montreal. I love smoked uh, uh, smoked meat and smoked sausages and all that good stuff. This uh, is great stuff. Uh, uh, luck, luckily, I got a real old world. Uh, oh, you got a call. That's all right. It shows us we're busy people. The phone ringing. That's okay. So, sorry about that. I should no, shut the phone. It off. happens. It happens. It happens. But uh, it reminds me of the uh, the fundraising uh, for public uh, television when you get the <laughs> phones going, a thousand phones in the background. shows that we're busy. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, uh, luckily there's a place nearby. Uh, they have a chain of old world Polish uh, provisions you know, where they smoke the sausages and they make everything fresh on the premises. I have it. It's like five minutes from your piast and I get I get anything I want. So... It's one, one, the good thing about this part of the country where I, I am in now, it's very multi-ethnic, and everything is available within driving distance. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's one of the nice things about Atlanta, too. We have this place called Patak Meats, Patak Bohemia, um, and it's about a half-hour, 35-minute ride from my house near the city uh, on, on the outskirts. Yeah. And uh, they make all kinds of uh, Polish, German, Ukrainian, um, Lithuanian sausages and, and dumplings and um, they actually do uh, uh, and the prices are so it's ridiculous you can get a, a, a pound of fresh brats for like two forty nine. that uh, they'll knock your socks off and they, they sell this stuff to cruise ships they sell it to uh, uh, if you go to Disneyland and you uh, uh, you happen to go to uh, Epcot and you eat sausage there then you're eating Patak sausage so um, yeah, those are the places that you know that you just you, you can't replace those. It's, the supermarket is not like a place like that. Oh, not, oh, oh, Hillshire Farms, forget about it. Yeah, that's not that's not even a discussion. So once you're spoiled to the real and accustomed to the real thing, you can't go back. You can't. No, you can't no. do you can't do Budweiser and Coors and Mills, and you can't do Hillshire Farms. No. It's all. There's only one real deal. Now, speaking of Canadian beer, do you like Molson's? Molson's Ice, Molson's Golden, and all that. Or yeah, I, th those are pretty good in the summertime as a um, uh, hot weather beer. I have a fondness for Labatt's that goes way back. Uh, in my younger days, I used to like Labatt's, but I still think it's a smooth, you know, drinkable uh, 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 beer for, uh, for for warm weather imbibing. Um, and I, I kind of think every beer has its place. As long as it's not loaded up with adjuncts uh, and uh, you know, super cheap supermarket beer, or not really supermarket beer, but you know the bushes and the keystones and that kind of thing. Absolutely. Now the the the, the best tasting cheap, quote unquote, cheap beer that I ever had in my life, and I loved it, and it was cheap as hell, and it was great. Genesee Cream Ale. Yeah, Jenny Cream. That's that's. Uh, I used to drink uh, my share of that in my uh, my early beer drinking days as well. Tennessee cream. And now, I also used to drink uh, Stroh's from Detroit. Stroh's Brewery Products. Stroh's uh, 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 used to be, before they, they made Old Milwaukee, which won, won some kind of awards domestically, uh, They it was called Stroh's. And I remember when as a kid, my Uncle Phil, before he was smart enough to move to the Florida Keys, he lived, he's from Eastern Shore, uh, he's from Maryland, he, you know, so, uh, right on the Chesapeake Bay, he had his cabin cruiser, I used to go down here in the summer, and he would uh, offer me strokes, and I would read the can as a kid, I would read the can, and it said, fired, brewed, strokes. What, what yeah. did that mean, sir? 
that so so of course Stroh's claim to fame was the uh, the eighteen packs. I'm sorry about that. I was just trying. That's to... That's all right. I'm getting buzzed from this uh, uh, dive back here. So oh, no much. But uh, so Stroh's claim to fame. In fact, when they first came out with the with the, uh, the eighteen packs, woo! Uh, yeah. Oh, they were either fifteen or eighteen packs. I can't recall. But I was actually working in a liquor store in those days, and uh, they were about ten ninety eight, and uh, you were getting. Uh, more beer than, than Miller or uh, Budweiser were giving you at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it, it was a, uh, it wasn't a bad beer. Uh, my brother actually used to drink it, and I'd, I'd steal a can here and there. But uh, the fire brood refers to the fact that they had direct fire uh, brewing on the, um, the, the brew kettles. So uh, that's an old-style uh, method of brewing. Uh, today, you know, you're more likely to have a brew kettle that's, Get uh, electric electrical uh, conduction heating or some other uh, you know fancy newfangled way, uh, but in those days, um, you know, a long time uh, uh, centuries ago, you didn't have that option. And, and the Strohs actually uh, that was their their uh, their other claim of fame was was using that direct kettle fire brewing method. Okay, now I want to take I want to switch the conversation before we we end it uh, uh, to uh, Asian beers. I used to drink um, Kirin, and um, uh, I wasn't uh, too crazy about, uh, what is it, Asahi? Uh, Asahi? Asahi. I, was, I like Kirin better, and I used to drink Qingdao, Chinese beer. Yes. And I used to get another super cheap beer that was like $3 a six-pack called uh, Dynasty Beer from China. And what do they all have in common? Well, it had a sake flavor. I, I, I can tell that they use rice in the process of making these uh, Asian beers. Now, what does the rice replace? Does it replace hops? Does it replace... I know they use barley in, 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 uh, in, in the Asian countries. Well, r rice is interesting enough, and, and, and I don't think... Uh, I don't think Jingdao is made with rice, actually. Jingdao is an interesting story because uh, that, the, uh, uh, that section of China was actually under the German sphere of influence uh, around uh, the turn of the... Uh, 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 of the century, around 1900 or so, um, when the European powers actually, uh, they all had spheres of influence along the, the, the Chinese coast. Uh, the Germans, of course, built breweries because they tend to do that everywhere they go. And uh, the, uh, the Chinese kind of caught on, and, and Jingdao is sort of the legacy of that German, uh, that, that German occupation, if you will. And again, you know, all of the European powers and, 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 uh, had their own... Uh, uh, little occupation zones in China, but in any event, they um, they they kind of you know they've stuck to their roots, and it's not actually when it's fresh. The problem is it's in those green bottles, and it gets skunked very easily. But if you get it fresh enough, it's got a clean malt character, and uh, and it's got a good dose of hops. But uh, so back to the rice, you know, you mentioned rice, and of course uh, Budweiser is famous for using rice uh, in their beer, and uh, it, it, it's actually what's called an adjunct. Um, corn is sometimes used as an adjunct, and really, adjuncts just imply, you know the, the name just means something that's used to supplement something else. A cheap filler yeah. is what you're trying to say. Yeah, it's sort of a filler, and I mean the the it doesn't have to be. You can make a decent beer using other grains. You know, you can make actually rye adds a lot of flavor, and makes makes a, a beer spicy. Wheat is a well known adjunct um, and brewing ingredient, uh, and then the, the British tend to use um, oats. Frequently, but uh, but rice is the, the you know if you think about rice and white rice, it's you know it's kind of boring, right? I mean, if, if, unless you add some butter and salt to it or something else or fry it up or whatever, it's it's exactly. not all that exciting, and and that's what it it does to tends to do to a beer. If you use rice in a beer, it kind of mellows it out, and and in my opinion, it detracts from the you know the the crisp biscuity malt flavors that barley imparts. I agree wholeheartedly. It's like when Adam Richman of the Travel Channel goes to an establishment and they stuff the sandwich with French fried potatoes, which is a cheap filler. It's a yeah. cheap filler. That's an excuse for the company, for the restaurant establishment to give you less meat, brother. Less meat. When they, anytime you see the French fries getting stuffed in there, it's a cheap filler. Yeah, they like it at Promonti Brothers. That, that's their claim to fame. Oh, so they, speaking I guess of they would argue I'm, with you. I'm sorry. That. Speaking but of Philly. I can see what you're saying. So. Okay, I'm sorry for interrupting you. Speaking of Philly, I have a bone to pick with uh, these uh, famous uh, Philly cheesesteak sandwich establishments. 
that have the audacity to use Velveeta as the cheese on top of the Philly cheesesteak sandwiches. Velveeta is not real cheese. It is processed garbage. Do you hear me? It is processed crap. It is not real cheese. That's yeah, it. You're, so you're a provolone guy, are you? Are you a cheesesteak? I, listen, going, if I ever went to France, uh, the, the one thing that stands out is cheese. I love cheese. Cheese is one of the greatest inventions of mankind. It's a fermented dairy product, of course. It's wonderful. I love real cheese, but not processed cheese. I don't, eat, I don't, I don't eat American cheese. I don't eat Velveeta. Uh, it's got to be the real deal. Fermented. Yeah, in the age. I mean that's. I think it's. I agree with you. It's. 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 It's definitely a substandard. Uh, it's probably what we we would call a, a. I don't know. It would be like a Coors Light of the cheese world, right? Um, yeah, yeah. It, it's not not that good, but the problem is that you know. I mean. Uh, even when you go to Philly and get a cheese stick with cheese whiz on it, it's almost become a cultural phenomenon in and of itself. Um, I like the sharp taste of provolone a lot better too, but uh, it's it's tough when you when you you know you get it in grain like that. Some people it's just just hard to get them away from it. Well, so. I I can eat I can order Philly cheese steak sandwiches at um around here at the, there's not too many real good traditional Southern barbecue restaurants, but there's one I know of where I go and I get pulled pork sandwiches and I get the ribs and all that good stuff, the brisket. And they have a Philly cheesesteak sandwich and they and they ask you what cheese you want. And, yeah. I, and I say Swiss or I could say provolone, you know. And, and of course, Wisconsin, where the German immigrants introduced, uh, brought the beer industry uh, along with St. Louis, uh, they, uh, they do make old world style cheese in America, domestic. At, at a lot lower price. But anyway, getting off Philly cheesesteaks, uh, a good friend of mine who is one of the cameramen of uh, Time Warner Cable TV, and I've been on there several times with my people, uh, Fritz the Cat. He's, uh, that's his, his name over on uh, Facebook. Fritz the Cat was telling me how, how wonderful and how many microbreweries are located in the state of Oregon and Washington. Yeah, that's. I've been to see. I haven't been to Portland. Portland is is uh, regarded as the uh, the beer capital of, of uh, the U.S. Really? There's some uh, there's some cities I think that come close to to rivaling it, and there are you know more on the way. Asheville, North Carolina, um, is uh, in the process. I mean, they're they're packed with breweries up there, and they uh, Sierra Nevada just announced that they're going to build a um, East Coast brewery right outside Asheville. Right. And uh, there's talk that uh, New Belgium might do it too. Seattle is another example of a great uh, beer city. I've actually uh, stumbled through the streets of, uh, I've been there a few times and uh, stumbled through the streets uh, from brew pub to brew pub to, uh, to beer bar and, uh, you know, great food, great beer. And uh, um, you try, you know, as uh, one thing you do, like, you know, when you, when you visit, um, uh, visit places around the country, and there's so much great beer these days. Is you know, you try to uh, you try to hit as many spots as you can, and try beers you've never tried before. Uh, and you try and you know, the short samples are always best because you know you don't want to drink too much, but uh, it, it sometimes becomes an occupational hazard. Oh yeah, so. definitely. Definitely. Uh, so, I think it's uh, you know again, I, I think it's great. Uh, uh, being somebody that came in um, to the, the, the craft beer scene just at the, at the really at the at the birth of it, and uh, um, you, you know, one thing that 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 I saw then was um, the relative dearth of of really good beers. You know, the, uh, the in those days, the the micros and the craft beers were even you know the better imports were a very small segment of the market, and it was really dominated by the big three, uh, and uh, you know how lucky we are today to to be able to go to a city and and have all of these choices, not just of different beers to drink, but beers that are actually made in the same, you know, uh, brewed in the back and and sold in the front, as Michael Jackson once said. So, well, I am very happy to see that uh, craft micro brew beers have elevated to the same level, or almost elevated to the same level of sophistication as wine. Yeah, I think I think we're pretty close. I think we're there. Um, you know, one of the nice things about beer, though, 
Um, I think it was Fritz Maytag. He said in the Beer Hunter series, he was talking about wine, and uh, you know, he said you you you, uh, you ferment it, and then you age it, and you study it, and then you age it in another barrel, and then you age it for five years after that, and then it still might not be ready. But for the most part, with beer, you know, you brew it and you drink it, and and that's it. And it can be complex, uh, and it can be very sophisticated right out of the. You know, after uh, maybe a month in the in the um, aging tanks, so uh, uh, and and some beers will hold up over time as well as, as wines do. So absolutely, you know what? So all you jabronis out there that are that go on spring break like a bunch of goofballs and and drink and puke and are only familiar with beer as a way of getting buzzed. Well, you know what? Screw you guys because beer is classy now. We beer has been elevated to to the levels of fine wine, and you know what? You don't even know. This is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, I'm very happy to be a member of uh, Honest Craft Beer Reviews, and you can check it out on Facebook. And the, and the man I'm interviewing now, Mr. John Starodumsky, is the founder and and uh, president of the uh, group. And uh, I in, want in parting, James, if I could just say, uh, if I could just speak me. just very briefly about the group, everybody's welcome. Um, we look for honest reviews of all kinds of beers. We look for people that, you know, um, uh, give their, their honest opinion and, and, and maybe talk about, you know, whether they think the beer is a good value for the money. And also, you know, beer trades, all that kind of stuff. Welcome. We just started the group, uh, you know, uh, because uh, we think there's a lot these days, there's a lot of dis dishonest uh, review uh, uh, hunting going on. People that are begging for free samples of beer, and and uh, you know, I mean, it's it's getting to the point where we think that um, you know people are more in it for just to get free beer than to than than to give their honest assessment of how good a beer is. And that's what a review should tell me, right? It should tell me, well, am I going to like this beer too, or is it worth right. fifteen bucks a six pack or whatever? And if you don't buy it, you really can't. You can't say that. And and you know, I think to a degree. There's, there's just yes yes men out there that are saying, yeah, this is a great beer because they know that if they bash it, that, that you know, there goes the gravy train and, and we're not going to get the free samples anymore. So that's what our group was founded on. Uh, uh, we, we love to talk about beer there, and, and uh, but we want honest reviews of beer and not endorsed reviews of beer. We don't want corporate ass kisses. Uh, we don't want people that are paid off. We want nothing but 100% pure, honest Hard-hitting truth, just like I do with the, my other shows, progressive discussions. I do want honest, hard-hitting truth in beer. You understand, Jabroni? So if you're ready to uh, take a nosedive into the huge tank of, uh, of craft, old-world-style micro-brew beer, then Honest Craft Beer Reviews is for you. And uh, I want to finish the show by making an attempt to sing the old Schaefer jingle. Uh, let me see if I know the words. Schaefer is the one beer to have when you're having more than one. Schaefer's pleasure doesn't fade even when your thirst is done. The most rewarding flavor in this man's world for people that are having fun. Schaefer is the one beer to have when you're having more than one. Was that the words? Bravo, bravo. All right, was that the words? All right, you know what, John, this has been an absolute pleasure. I have enjoyed. Yeah, invite the dog with help. What kind of dog do you got? Sorry, my house is so noisy there. But, uh, yeah, what, what do you got? You got a tough to, dog? We're going to have to do this again, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, this, uh, God willing, if uh, technically everything went well, and knock on wood, knock on shillelagh, I hope it did. Uh, I hope that, you know, uh, we do it again, and uh, this uh, uh, show... Of course, will be on the internet and it will be on live stream. And uh, if you want to search for it, you just type in your name and or Honest Craft Beer Reviews, and it, it should Google on the front page. It should come up on the front page. Give it a little time. But like I said, I got some promo. 
I got some things to add to it. So uh, it, it might go over really well. Hey, you know what? Some people were discovered on the internet, like Justin Bieber's uh, videos, you know? Yes. The right people like the like what they saw, and the rest is history. You never know. This might really become big. And, and the founding fathers, yourself, uh, shit, excuse me, Red Rooster, who introduced me to you in Honest Craft Beer Reviews, Red Rooster, who I, I, I uh, call my uh, a co-producer, even though, you know, it, it's not official yet because he hasn't accepted. I salute all of you. All right, Red is the one that introduced me, and uh, he said he met you um, connected with when he left the Marine Corps. Yeah, we were, we were in college together. Oh, and, wow. Uh, and it was beer. So we just started talking about beer one day and uh, in the cafeteria uh, of, of the of, of the community college of Rhode Island, and uh, the rest is history. Wow, so, yeah, very intelligent man. I know he's yes. a huge wrestling fan. Right now, me and my people are working on uh, what we need is a building. We have all the talent. We, we're going to be starting, God willing, a new pro wrestling TV tape show on Time Warner. And I used to do color commentary, and I will be doing color commentary with Mr. Erwin Benz of Time Warner. Benzy, of Benzy Promotions. And uh, it should be a lot of fun. You know, uh, I used to like the heels. I, I was a heel. Uh, it's fun because people love to hate you. You get to go off on the fans. Get to yell at people. Get to tell them off. And you Looking forward to it. You don't get fired. <laughs> but you know what? If you happen to be in the in the um, in the Hudson Valley, New York area ever, and uh, this show gets off the ground, you're more than welcome to sit next to me and do help me do color commentary and uh, promote your agenda. So, all right, I thank you. That. I'll pick thank, you up on that. Thank you, Mr. John Starodovsky. This has been a pleasure. Same here. Bye bye.